team. Thank you. Uh, well, hopefully I will... Thank you for staying for the last talk. Hopefully I'll, it'll be informative for you. Uh, so my name is Path. Uh, I work on a bunch of platform security related uh, for, uh, efforts, such as firmware, for firmware. Uh, for example, firmware integrity, verification, and management. This is the kind of things that I usually work on. This is something I did as a side thing, um, uh, as one of the investigating things, uh, research. Uh, today, we'll talk about Intel MT, how to use it and abuse it. As a warning, I am a Linux user, which means the presentation has a natural leaning towards it. So if I miss some Windows stuff, please feel free to tell me. Uh, here's what I wanted to do when I started working on this presentation. Uh, I wanted to explore the best possible attack using legitimate AMT functionality, so no vulnerabilities. Once I'd explored that attack, then I wanted to present my story of that attempt. So all the challenges I faced, all the roadblocks encountered during a practical attempt. Hopefully showcase the complexities involved for an attacker, and you can decide at the end how realistic this is for your situations. Uh, I also wanted to present all the available options for people on how they can detect, mitigate, prevent such attacks, and finally present a story on how to do forensics if an attack like this does happen. Uh, the reason I put in the effort to, to put together this presentation is to share what I've learned. I've been looking at AMT on and off for a couple of years, and I think a lot of the implications are not clear. Uh, despite being documented. So a lot of the stuff is mostly well documented, um, but the implications are not easy. So by, doing, by doing this presentation, I want to save you guys some time. Uh, but before we jump into those three things, uh, let's develop a shared understanding of the AMT basics. So we have an idea of what it is that we're dealing with. So in this section, we'll cover what is Intel AMT, AMT's core features, requirements for using AMT, provisioning options, then a couple of sides on AMT in the news recently and the open source tools that are currently available if you want to use AMT. First up, what is AMT? AMT is designed to be an always available solution, so even when there is no OS or even when the machine is off. It's meant to be available as long as network and power are connected. Those are the only requirements. It's implemented within the management engine. Uh, the ME runs on the chipset itself, which is separate from the main processor. Uh, talking about the ME is a separate presentation in itself. Um, and since AMT is part of the ME as a module, it's effectively hard-coded into hardware. So if you have an Intel platform, you could have AMT. Hopefully you can see why I call it the ghost of the machine, although uh, I've received feedback from my colleagues that um, that name is more aptly reserved for the system management mode. But you know, this is more catchier. Anyway, let's take a look at the core features of AMT. Uh, AMT allows you to do pretty much everything as if you were physically present. Power management, remote power on, off, restarts. You can boot off a network image presented as a CD-ROM or a floppy drive to the system. So the Intel ME will emulate a uh, full ID CD-ROM drive to the system, and the OS will think it's physically plugged in. Uh, I actually tested mounting a remote floppy that was 1 GB in size and that way you can exfil quite a, few quite a lot of data, because CD-ROM is mounted as read-only. Uh, KVM, you can observe, take over control, like, as if you're physically present. This requires the display to be connected to the Intel integrated GPU, which for laptops is generally true. Uh, serial over LAN, similar to the CD-ROM, a serial port is emulated by the ME. Uh, this has many use cases, one core usage is for managing BIOSes, since most modern biases allow redirecting screen to serial. So you can reboot, redirect the BIOS to serial, and now you can manage the BIOS sitting somewhere in the middle of nowhere. One of the most interesting features is the client-initiated remote access, or CIRA. One use case is a user is off-site, can initiate remote help at boot time. We'll work with a broken OS or even with no OS, so you know, it's really good for remote help. The idea for this is for, well, the idea with CIRA is for AMT to connect to an admin server when someone is off-premise, and to create a tunnel for support personnel. So this way, you can bypass NAT or whatever else network restrictions you may have. So AMT will initiate the connection to your admin server, and then you can use that tunnel to talk back to AMT. Uh, CRO tunnel can also be set to auto-dial out at specified times for checking centrally. So if this is intended for checking in for new settings or checking in if the laptop has been marked as stolen, maybe you don't want to allow, uh, allow usage anymore. 
So hopefully you've got a good idea of AMT capabilities. Uh, next, what are the requirements for having AMT on your laptop or desktop? There are three steps for being able to use AMT remotely. One, manufacturer decision. Two, BIOS setting, basically an on and off switch in the BIOS menu, and AMT setup itself. Because of manufacturer decision, AMT is not always present in most consumer devices. Uh, from my understanding, the ME module and the AMT module cost extra for manufacturers in licensing fees from Intel. But business desktops or business laptops usually come with AMT as an add-on, feature add. And it's usually also enabled by default in the BIOS. Uh, some of the more beefier spec consumer devices also fall into this category because they're sort of business devices. Uh, so here, what does provisioned mean? Uh, it means to activate any of the AMT interfaces for usage. Uh, so a bunch of bare minimal settings must be set, and the process of doing that is called provisioning. Uh, what the bare minimum settings are depends on how you provision it. So there are multiple methods for provisioning, and how you provision it will also determine the provisioning mode, uh, which I don't have in this uh, diagram, but I'll cover in the next slide. So let's take a look at the provisioning options. Generally speaking, there are four broad ways you can provision AMT for usage, and there are two provisioning modes once the provisioning is done. So the provisioning mode ACM or CCM is meant to reflect the level of trust required to complete the setup process. Note that all of these intermingle and can be used in combination with each other. So try not to think of them as distinct options. Uh, so one option is uh, provisioning through local agent on OS. So it requires Intel AMT software to be installed and running as root or admin. You can do this via your custom tool, uh, or you can install the Windows tooling. There's Windows tooling for it. There's no Linux tooling. This method will put uh, AMT in client-controlled mode, which gives you limited capabilities. You can carry out additional steps to transition it into uh, admin control mode, which gives you full functionality. Uh, another option for provisioning is remote. This requires pre-setup either at factory or via USB. Like I said, these options intermingle, so you can use USB with the remote option. So the remote option requires pre-setup. In that case, once the pre-setup is done, AMT will send a hello packet uh, on the local LAN for up to six hours after first power on. After that, it will stop. And this is that time period is configurable up to 24 hours max. Uh, the responding server who responds to the hello packet must present a certificate which is pre-trusted by the AMT. And that, that trusted certificate is configurable, either again at factory or via USB. So it's, you know, it's, not, it's not a terrible system. Uh, third option is USB. Uh, you can create a setup.bin file, put it on a FAT32 USB, and configure AMT at boot time. Just plug it in, boot, configured. Finally, the last option is provisioning via uh, the BIOS MEBX menu, which is Control P, reboot, and then you just go through the BIOS menu. This is uh, 10 easy to follow steps that takes about 10, 30 seconds to carry out. Note that these methods can, use, can be used to set further options even after provisioning is technically complete. The line between provisioning and configuration is a bit blurry. To be, to be precise, the provision can be considered complete as soon as AMT exposes any of its two interfaces for use. So it's local interface and remote interface, which usually happens as soon as you change the default password. So the default password is admin, admin, and then as soon as you change it, it's generally considered provision no matter which method you used. Once provisioning is complete and you're in ACM mode, you have, full set of, uh, you have access to full set of options and features via AMT APIs, which are exposed through its local and remote API, uh, interfaces. But you can still use these methods even after AMT is fully provisioned to set further limited settings. Anyway, I think that's, that's enough on provisioning. <laughs> um, so that's pretty much the most of the background. Some of you may probably have seen this things in the news. AMT has been in the news this year. Uh, first, we have the Intel SA75, escalation of privilege vulnerability. Uh, this was basically HTTP uh, digest auth could be bypassed with a null response. So, this is the easiest vulnerability there was. You just respond with nothing and you're in. Uh, for this attack to be successful, AMT needs to be obviously provisioned. An attacker needs to be on the same local network. So it, its impact is limited. A patch is available, so if you haven't patched, you may want to look into it. 
The second thing that was in the news is the malware developed by the Platinum Group, which was seen hiding communication from the OS by using AMT serial over LAN. So any software you may have running in the OS that may look for suspicious traffic will not see this. Is there more to come? Uh, there is an ME talk scheduled at Black Hat, which uh, I'm looking out for. Black Hat uh, London. Uh, here's some quick notes on the tools that are available. Uh, this is all open source. Thankfully, it's all in one central convenient place. Uh, I used both of these tools throughout my presentation, as well as the older Mesh Central. So the current version is Mesh Central True, and there's an older version. I also played with that a bit. It's all open source, and uh, the major contributors to the code are our Intel employees. OK, let's go back to our original <laughs> premise of looking for the best practical attack using Intel AMT. Now we know a bit about AMT. When I started this exercise, this is what I wanted to achieve. Obviously, when I started, I didn't know if this was really possible. It seemed likely from the documentation I'd read, you know, it was like, oh, yeah, this, this seems plausible. So my goal here is to control AMT, maintain persistent access, and then remain stealthy in the process. Those are my attacker goals. Before we jump into that, uh, let's quickly cover what to do afterwards. I didn't carry any of these out as part of this exercise since there's nothing AMT specific about this. But this is just so you can see an end-to-end. -end. What do you do after you have AMT control? So if you're a standard attacker, you can use AMT to restart the machine, boot your own disk, uh, replace unencrypted boot, uh, unencrypted boot parts on the hard drive, and use that to hijack the boot password. If, there's a, if there is disk, disk encryption, come back a few days later and use encryption password to replace binaries on disk, and now you have full access. Anyone with repeated physical access to your machine can do this today. The only difference with AMT is potentially one of physical access is required. The reason I put down easy to hard in the difficulty here is because success here depends on if secure boot or trusted boot are being used. Uh, and also, even if some or all of these things are being used, how the BIOS is protected also contributes. We'll touch on it again when we talk about mitigations later on. As a sophisticated attacker, you can, again, use AMT to restart machine to own your own boot disk. But this time, insert a system management mode backdoor into the flash chip since we have root in the box. This is not as universal as previous attack, and most machines do severely lock down the BIOS region using flash protections now. So that's why I kind of put it in the sophisticated attacker category. Now, I have a kind of open question that you can answer at the end of the presentation. Did I miss a scenario here? What, what would you do if you had AMT control? You know, How would you exploit? OK, so let's explore our first aim of getting AMT control. What are our options for provisioning AMT on a target machine? So we can subvert the supply chain. The complexity is high. You can say this is medium, depends how you define this. Maybe you, you think you know, a postman leaving a laptop unattended for five hours is medium difficulty. You just have to get the right timing. Here, I think the likely attacker is uh, someone who's highly resourced, either casting a wide net or targeting someone. Provisioning method could be anything. You have full access to the machine for as long as you want. Uh, the next option is you already have root or admin on the machine. The provisioning method obviously is local agent on the OS. Complexity high if, if you think uh, modern OSs are well protected. Medium if you think getting root is easy. Another reason you might label this high is because provisioning via local agent will get you uh, client controlled mode, not admin controlled mode, which doesn't give you full functionality. Uh, likely attacker, again, I think sophisticated attacker looking for long-term persistence because you don't really gain anything extra if you already have root in the box. I mean, you just you get to hide now. Both of these, I think, are hard to carry out and unlikely for different reasons. And the, the last attack vector, which you probably have suspected already, is the physical, uh, physical access. Uh, so I, I think the complexity is low. Likely attacker is targeted or opportunistic could be an evil made type attack or shipment interception. Provisioning method here is cool limited. You have USB or physically via the BIOS menu. For me, if the physical access seemed like the easiest way to proceed, this is what I, when I was reading documentation, I thought, hey, I could, this could work. So let's tweak our original goals now that we've picked this. 
So easiest attack vector requires physical access, access so desktops are occluded. Laptops also travel and get left unattended, so to me this seems re realistic. I've written Lenovo X1 Carbon 2016 here, but I've also tested it with uh, a few other laptops. This is just a target device I used. <laughs> Firstly, let's, let's go through some assumptions that we've kind of already made, just make that clear. Firstly, obviously the machine we target has to have AMT. <laughs> Uh, next, Intel AMT should not have already been provisioned, because if it's already provisioned, then we don't know the admin password, we can't get in. This is the problem we face when you're doing forensics. Uh, some BIOSes do allow unprovisioning from the normal BIOS menu, so you can go into BIOS and say unprovision AMT. So as an attacker, you could do that. Um, but other BIOSes do not. It depends on the vendor. Some vendors will ask you for a BIOS password or an AMT password, or some vendors won't. So there's some inconsistencies there. Thirdly, the MEBX password, which is also known as the ME password, should still be the Intel default, which is admin. Uh, if you are a large enough customer, then you can ask your manufacturer to change this. Most people don't, unless they're, all, they're planning to use AMT. So it seems like a reasonable assumption that it's still the default. Finally, either AMT should already be enabled, or a BIOS password is not set, so we can enable it ourselves if necessary. So observe, what I've observed is HP will, let, will not let you enter AMT setup BIOS menu without knowing the BIOS password, but the Lenovo device, which is what I've used here, did. There's some inconsistencies there again. And it's frozen. Sorry. Okay. So this is an ideal attack scenario. I look for an opportunity or create a distraction, uh, and then since I'd like to spend as little time as needed to provision uh, AMT, plug in a USB, which will auto-provision AMT, and it will set up a client-initiated remote access, which will call out to my command and control server, running somewhere in the cloud, and then profit, I'm, I'm done. That's just, this is the ideal scenario. When I read the documentation, this is what I saw was possible. Does that seem possible in another 60 seconds? Maybe even 30 seconds? So this is the ideal. This is what I want to do. I get a message, I press was, yes, unplug the USB, walk away. Done. Uh, as you were expecting, unfortunately, uh, things weren't so simple. <laughs> yeah, well, my, my target attack is a laptop, so. <laughs> Yeah, servers, I'm assuming, are physically protected. <laughs> um, anyway, so here's, here's what I found trying to do this. Uh, USB provisioning file can be really easily created using existing open source software. Uh, it worked really easily, and it worked even when it shouldn't have, it seems to me. Um, when I, what do I mean by that? It worked even when a BIOS password was set. It just worked. It worked even when I had disabled the USB in the BIOS menu. So it's still the, there was still power on the USB. It worked even when I had removed uh, USB from the boot priority order. So maybe, maybe these are bugs. Maybe this is intentional. Only a, number, a very limited number of settings can be set via USB. So CRAP connection, unfortunately, could not be set. That's what I wanted. It want, I wanted it to dial out to me. I couldn't do that. To do that, uh, I would have to set a provisioning server, which in turn can push those configurations down. Um, so this, this is a complication, and I wanted things to be easy. Anyway, so now I have a couple of options to get CRO to work. Option A is set a provisioning server via USB and use that to push CRO settings. Firstly, now the problems are provisioning server has to be on the same network, so same LAN won't work on an external network because uh, response to hello packets won't be received by AMT without a CRI tunnel. It's kind of a chicken and egg problem. So we'll need to bring along a Raspberry Pi or something similar running a provisioning server that we can plug in. Secondly, there's no easy to use Linux software for the provisioning server. So you can carry a large Windows laptop or I don't know, Windows tablets, I guess. Uh, and writing my own, own provisioning server uh, seemed like too much work. So there was an easier option available. <laughs> which was option B. Uh, manual setup through LAN. So in this case, once AMT is configured via the USB, I would connect the laptop's LAN to my own network and use the AMT API, since AMT is now fully provisioned, to set up CRA. 
So it should be a script that calls out. So it adds about extra 30 seconds if, you, if it's pre-scripted. And if you do it through a nice GUI, then it adds about three more minutes to your attack. And the reason I mentioned the GUI is because there is a YouTube video titled uh, Mesh Central to Intel AMT Sierra. It walks you through how to do this. I ended up going with option B, easier. In both cases, though, you need either built-in LAN within the laptop, or you need a native LAN adapter. So let's update our assumptions. There's one extra assumption now. So for our attack, the machine needs to have either built-in LAN or native LAN, which AMT will use to listen to by default. USB LAN adapters will not work. AMT does not listen to them. It has to be native to the laptop. For the X1, Carbon X1 that I was using, it doesn't have built-in LAN, but it does have a custom LAN adapter which does a pass-through to the system board. So you plug in this LAN adapter, it has a special connector, and it's seen as native LAN by the system. So my assumption here is generally business laptops will either have native LAN or will have these types of adapters because business users have a wider variety of use cases. So this seems like an acceptable assumption to me. So attack steps. And this is where I can't see my slides. Uh, preparation, set up USB using Mesh Commander, set up Command and Control Server using Mesh Central 2, write AMT Sierra script, bring a LAN adapter and cable. Uh, and then, for the execution, reboot, plug in USB, let the provisioning complete, plug in LAN cable and maybe an adapter, or depending on the laptop I'm attacking, trigger the script, and then walk away. Now, we can finally see some results. Here are the results. No more roadblocks, thankfully. Here we connected uh, via Sierra, and we can see that Sierra is set up. It is configured to dial out to my command and control server every 10 seconds and maintain a persistent tunnel forever as soon as the connection is established. Mesh Central 2, the open source software, takes care of the rest. I don't have to do anything else. I even configured Sierra to dial out over Wi-Fi in case LAN is down. So I only need LAN to set up. Once I have set up LAN, I can set up Wi-Fi, and they can dial out to me on the Wi-Fi. In this screenshot, I'm connected to AMT via Sierra tunnel, which is established over Wi-Fi. I also tested KVM over the Sierra tunnel. This was tested over LAN only, though. There are some complications. Uh, we cannot do this over Wi-Fi without an OS agent or helping Wi-Fi driver. AMT would hand back control of the Wi-Fi radios to the OS whenever a Wi-Fi driver is loaded. In normal cases, the Wi-Fi driver is meant to pass the messages between AMT and OS. Uh, I didn't try this as we didn't assume having that level of access from the beginning. We didn't assume admin root access. But as an attacker, you can load the correct driver once you have AMT control. Other functionality that I didn't test because it's not developed yet, because Mesh Central True is being actively developed, is uh, remote mounting and booting disks, not implemented through CRI yet. It exists as a separate feature. I did test this independently, like, like I mentioned with the floppy drive. So AMD seems to be more useful when machine is connected to LAN. Uh, LAN. Um, some people do use laptop docs, but it's not significant or reliable. As mentioned before, Wi-Fi control is handed to OS when Wi-Fi driver loads. Um, but to use Wi-Fi, the profiles must be loaded into AMT. AMT supports up to 16 profiles. Attacker, unfortunately, needs to know which local APs to connect to and what the credentials are. So if you're surrounded by well-known APs lit, like we are today, um, life is good as an attacker. Uh, boot injection method that we mentioned earlier, that I mentioned earlier about the standard attack, uh, is still possible with Wi-Fi. When you load your custom OS reboot, you don't load a Wi-Fi driver. As soon as the Wi-Fi driver is loaded, wi uh, radio control is handed back. So just don't load any Wi-Fi drivers, and AMT will stay in control. Hopefully, you've got a fair idea of what's involved for using AMT for attack, despite the Wi-Fi limitations. It definitely seems like something to be worried about, uh, since it has such powerful, legitimate features. This concludes the attacker focus side of the presentation. 
Uh, next, do we can, uh, what can us defenders do? It's actually what I normally do, defend. So let's look at the options we have for detection, mitigation, and prevention. First up, how do we detect when an attacker is abusing the ghost of the machine? Network-based, so look for well-known network ports. Uh, they're well-documented in TCP 9871 for provisioning requests, or if CRI is being used, then the source packets will always be between 16992 and 16995. These are the ports that are allocated to, to the ME. Um, CRI connections can be mutual TLS, though. Um, in that case, the way mutual TLS is set up for CIRA is server public key is inserted into AMT at setup time and trusted. So you insert your public key, mark it, trusted, mark it as trusted. AMT will generate a certificate pair, the private key, of, private key of which can never be exported. And the server uses that for string verification. So during CIRA also, all inbound network ports are, uh, ports are closed. So you can't just do a network scan and hope to find all the AMT devices. Uh, but if the attacker isn't using CRA, then you will find it. The other problem with network-based detection is you can't really dist distinguish between AMT traffic and OS-originated MTLS traffic. The second option you have for detection is an OS agent. So have an agent running as root, which is talking to the ME interface. Uh, if the attacker already controls the OS when your agent is running, when your agent first starts running, then the response could be faked because the attacker has OS control. So your tool has to be deployed prior to OS compromise. For Windows, this is not too hard as the, there is existing tooling. For Linux, you would have to write your own and deploy your own. As an aside, uh, I did network captures of CDRS sessions using a physical network tap sitting between uh, the laptop and the LAN, and this confirmed MTLS. Yes, I fi. <laughs> There's also detection by the user, because you are doing KVM. So custom OS boot can be seen. You know, if the user is sitting in front of the screen and they just reboot to a random OS, you know, they'll probably freak out. Uh, there is a Windows tray, tray app called IMSS, which will show a pop-up whenever AMT is provisioned or any AMT-related action is performed. This is sometimes installed by default, but uh, I mean, if, if you're an enterprise rolling your own custom image, then maybe you remove it. Obviously, it's unknown how users will if users will even notice the pop-ups, because they're just kind of like small yellow pop-ups that come up that constantly Windows seems to throw at you anyway. Uh, finally, K KVM will always display an animated sprite on screen to warn users. This cannot be disabled. It's, it's built into the AMT. Uh, and if you're in client control mode, then you can't initiate KVM without user consent. In admin control mode, you can. OK, what about mitigations? So. This is the ideal mitigation. Have a verified boot chain. This way, you can't replace uh, the bootloader with a malicious bootloader because the machine just won't boot anymore, or the hard drive won't decrypt your password anymore, so you just can't boot anymore. Perfect. Win for Windows, this is doable because secure boot is supported and BitLocker is available. It's about setting it up correctly, though. I don't know how well that's done. Um, the other, other thing to keep in mind with uh, Windows is that if the BIOS does not have a password, then an attacker can just go to the BIOS and disable the code boot. Uh, but if you still have TPM-bound hard drive encryption keys, then you're still protected. It just depends what layer of uh, protection you've already enabled. Uh, existing mitigations that are already in place for most people is, well, not, not many people using the LAN regularly. So, you know, Wi-Fi limitations are imposed by AMT. Some enterprises that only allow internet access through a proxy, uh, a CRI doesn't work over just a proxy. You need to have uh, kind of uh, na uh, naked connection to the internet. So you're saved there. Uh, with uh, using KVM, attackers can try avoid using KVM when they think people might be using the machine. So at night, for example. But there's always the possibility of user discovery. You know, I sometimes work till 3 a.m., so <laughs> I wouldn't notice, hopefully. Uh, finally, how can you prevent such attacks altogether? Well, by machines without AMT. Unfortunately, 
beefy spec machines, you just come with AMT by default. It's really hard to get away from. So if you're an enterprise wanting to buy well-equipped uh, machines for your engineers, you don't really have too much option. Second, get in there yourself, so you take control. Uh, this way you're signing up for enterprise management of AMT, which is a different nightmare in itself. But maybe if you want to use, because the legitimate features may still be useful for you. And finally, disable it. Uh, this is actually a lot more complicated than you think. <laughs> uh, because different vendors have different tooling for how you disable it. Once you ha already have a fleet of a few hundred thousand machines and you go, actually, I want to disable AMT now, you're like, okay, every vendor will give you a different tool <laughs> and it'll be inconsistent. And you still have to make sure you have a BIOS password because otherwise the attacker can just enable it again. So now you have two problems. <laughs> Disable AMT and roll out BIOS passwords. And you don't obviously want to roll out the same BIOS password, so now you have a third problem, <laughs> unique BIOS passwords. Um, as an aside, Lenovo laptops have a BIOS setting called permanent disable AMT. I haven't tried it. I have no idea what it does. Sounds permanent. Um, so in short, the two real options you have is Either take control yourself or disable AMT and set a password. Finally, uh, and another random thing to mention is you need to kind of make sure that the BIOS actually respects the disable choice. There was a bug from Lenovo from last year where even, AM, even when AMT was disabled, USB provisioning still worked. So they have fixed it since. So <laughs> I should say that. OK, now the final part of my presentation. Hopefully, the defenders have some options available to them. What about if you're an incident responder? What if someone takes over AMT on your machine and you somehow detect it? What forensics options do you have? As I alluded to before, if an AMT password is set, you can't get in at all. You're completely locked out. Dechipping physically is an option, but uh, it's not very scalable in terms of cost or time. AMT API without admin password is completely useless. Of course, we can use the auth bypass vulnerability that I mentioned in AMT in the news, but you know you should have patched that, right? Uh, and of course, why contemplate when things happen for you? Uh, so a plugin that I had written uh, for internal network scans detected a provisioned AMT during one of the regular scans. Um, Admin pass unknown, obviously, and the, oh, and the owner goes, I don't know what this is and what's happening. So now things get interesting. Bit panicky, but interesting. So first up, we did due diligence. A colleague checked network locks for everyone who had ever talked to any of the AMT ports on that machine. The answer was, everything looks good. There's nothing suspicious. All the internal people on internal IPs. Um, I collected a BIOS dump using GUR. So if you don't know GUR, GUR is a Google's incident response tool. It's open source. So it allows you to collect BIOS dumps. So I collected a BIOS dump from that machine. I ver verified that collection against the official BIOS for that machine by uh, pulling it apart using UFI extract. That's actually what I work on normally. <laughs> um, so anyway, the results of that was all good. The BIOS looked like it hadn't been modified. Nothing to worry about, right? Uh, but you know, there's that knowing feeling in your head about, well, what's really going on? So I asked Intel for help, reached out. Uh, about how, how do we do forensics. I had a quick meeting and found out that no one had asked them before. Um, <laughs> I was pointed to a, a Windows tool. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. OK. Um, I was pointed to a Windows tool, which can be run to generate a status report. Uh, I asked about Linux, since, since the machine that was uh, detected was running Linux, and I don't want to boot Windows unnecessarily. Uh, unfortunately, in the AMT doesn't have Linux team anymore, so they have no Linux team tooling. So this is what I wanted, a Linux tool that gives me the full AMT audit log. Now the AMT audit log uh, logs all actions, and it can be cleared by an admin user, but clearing it leaves a log saying someone cleared it. So it's at least some, some of some use. What I got was a Windows tool. I did run the Windows tool. Uh, the output was just the AMT has been provisioned at this date. Like, okay, I know that. Okay, what's what actually happened? What did someone do with it? 
I dug around in the Windows tool and learned that it was calling uh, get local system account via the ME interface. Um, there is a built-in user called dollar dollar OS admin with limited access. This that call retrieves the password for that user. Now, password is randomly generated at each boot, maximum once every 24 hours. Account cannot be disabled, and password cannot be controlled. But the OS admin user doesn't have anywhere near the same full access. It just has very limited local access. So I set about replicating this to Linux. Uh, thankfully, the ME interface driver is already in mainline. I don't have to do anything there. The driver is already exposed. You can see it at slash dev slash MEI usually MEI 0 or MEI by itself. I need IOCTL to talk to it, so I wrote a quick Python hack since I was slightly panicky about the situation. Uh, and on reflection, doing IOCTL using Python was not the best idea. Uh, but now my work is public, so you can update it. I got the password, but the credentials didn't work. And when I read into it, I found out that another limitation the OS admin has, it has to be accessed through local AMT interface, and not remote interface. Um, now, here's the problem. The OS can't talk to the AMT ports locally, because if you send network packets to a loop, loop back interface, it never touches hardware. It just, it's just processed by software. And the way AMT and ME respond is by grabbing network packets directly off the physical adapter. It never reaches the OS. So now you have to bridge this gap. What are our options? Well, digging more, found out that I needed the local manageability service in this diagram. So what the LMS is responsible for exposing the exact same network ports that are remotely exposed, but to local hosts through the ME interface. So this w software is available for Windows, obviously. <laughs> uh, there is a Linux version, thankfully. It was open source quite a few years ago, but it's not maintained. But I was able to use it and proceed. So building it on Linux required a few fixes, and the patch for that is in the repository at the end. Uh, the bugs are pretty minor. And since I have nowhere to report, it's, I just kind of left it as a patch in my repository. At the end, I did succeed in dumping the full AMT log using the credentials through LMS. Audit log records were base64 encoded. The decoder string was seemed mostly garbage. The reason I say mostly is because I could see words like admin but the rest was just garbage. So uh, there was some kind of a struct there. Um, no public documentation on what it was. I tried really hard. And this is where you know, I went, Google, you're failing me. <laughs> really, really uh, at the end of my rope there. I continued digging. And I think as, out of desperation, I downloaded Intel M AMT SDK, which is, uh, I think, 200 megs, uh, meant to contain sample code for all API calls, so I was like, okay, I'll do an egrep through this, right? That, that will end well. Uh, so I did egrep-r audit log, and well, a few days later, uh, f and four layers of indirection later, I found these structs. It was called very something very generic. <laughs> um, so I have referenced it in the uh, repository I'm open sourcing, so you can find it without spending two days on it. Getting those structs to decode was actually also very painful, especially because the field lengths within the structs were used to indicate whether the next field even existed. So there was this kind of cascading effect. Um, so now we have the audit log. And here it is. This is the one from the actual machine. Uh, what, what my findings were, uh, AMT was provisioned on the 23rd of January, 2015. But uh, Google received the machine on the 27th of September, 2016. So is it a factory mistake, shipment interception? But the rest of the audit log, there was about 80 plus entries documenting every time someone touches the network interface. They looked OK. Like the IPs matched the network uh, logs that we saw outside. Nothing else was suspicious here. This is just the oddity I saw. So it's like, do we close the investigation now? Everything's OK, right? Everything's OK? But, you know. Obviously, you turn over every leaf you can. So I emailed the machine vendor asking for history before Google, since it, had, it looked like the provisioning happened before the machine was received. 
26 emails, 26 emails, two weeks later, here's what I learned. Machine was actually received in 2013. <laughs> it went, it started its life as part of a lab. It was being used for hardware qualification. So it was not part of standard inventory. So it was never registered. AMT was used within this lab legitimately so they could remotely reboot the system and re-image it as ne is needed. And then on the 27th of September 2016, when the inventory record was created, is when it was moved from the lab into general pool. And AMT was not unprovisioned during this transfer. <laughs> so the lesson I learned from this was uh, inventory is hard, uh, and next time I'm just going to track down the full machine history first before I waste three weeks of my life doing forensics. But that concludes my, my forensic story. Um, uh, and this is just a quick update. This is what I've learned since writing this presentation. Um, and I can't see my slide, sorry, just one second. So micro LMS is available as an alternative LMS, and uh, Mesh Commander has a save all state option, which I didn't consider. It could be quite useful from a forensics perspective. And uh, Intel has given me that, uh, which is, from what I can tell, they're looking to add more Linux AMT tools, and they're also looking to make the AMT auditing a lot easier to access than all the hoops that I had to go through to get to it. Okay, we're near the end, near the end. <laughs> Recovery, what are your options once compromise in forensics is done? So what do you do? You have this AMT that you don't control. Without knowing the admin password, you cannot unprovision programmatic, programmatically unless you're in client control mode. So the next steps really depends on the vendor of your laptop. Some vendors have this unconfigure AMT option within the BIOS. Some vendors don't. And other vendors, like for example Lenovo in this case, which I used, the unconfigure AMT is part of the disable flow, which is not clear until I carried it out. So unfortunately, that's kind of all the options you have. So once you get there, you're like, okay, you have to call your vendor and say, what do I do? And the main reason is because even though there is an API call, it's not available to you as a dollar dollar OS admin user. Okay, so in short, we can say that attacking, attacking AMT is possible. Detection and pre prevention is difficult, although mitigation is achievable. And lastly, forensics is at least reliable. As a takeaway, I would highly recommend you guys go through my suggestions from the detection, mitigation, prevention slide section. It's like four slides. And see which of them apply to your personal or company situation. Because you may want to just increase uh, the level of mitigation and prevention you currently have. So things to look at would be detection, network and OS, mitigation, you know, start working on verified boot, and prevention. So either disable AMT, set a BIOS password, or don't buy it, or provision it completely yourself, whatever, whatever works for you. That's it. Thank you for listening. If you have any thoughts on what can be done next, I'm happy to hear. And uh, the original question I asked, what would you do given AMT control? Okay. That's pretty complete. Uh, questions? Hi, are you familiar with uh, ME Cleaner? Sorry, can you say that? Are you familiar with ME Cleaner? ME Clear, the one that uh, that disables uh, that the disabled. Yes, I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that might be a, a mitigation uh, method. It, it, it's yeah, um, I guess it is, but uh, I, th I think it's neat for a personal use case, but for an enterprise, it's complicated. Uh, you have to kind of remember you would have. Like, for example, if you try it at this laptop and it stops working, the vendor is not, uh, no longer going to provide support, right? So you <laughs> there is a risk there indeed, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Uh, more questions? Uh, right. God, you're keeping me running around. I have a question with uh, how the um, AMT communicates with the C2 
system. You said it uses either the Wi-Fi or the LAN. Yeah. Um, does it, but one thing that is not clear, I understand the C2 must be in the same LAN segment. A C2 mustn't, doesn't have to be in the same LAN okay. segment. Okay. Only so the provisioning server if you use that option. Okay, so you need somehow some uh, IP stack working to be able to communicate with the C2. So do you use the IP settings or the operating system or does the AMT establishes its own uh, IP address? How exactly do, does that work? For so instance, what I'm thinking about is how it compares to an ILO setup. With how it HP. compares to, sorry, what? With an uh, HP ILO system where the ILO card has a completely separate IP address and so on. No, it's not separate, it hijacks OS IP. So, for, uh, so one of the interesting things you notice is, for example, if you're using uh, certificates for LAN authentication, once your OS is booted, AMT will just, just use the same certificates because you're, you're already authenticated with the LAN. And second question. Uh, so the provisioning server needs to be on the same LAN segment. You said it was potentially complex and so on. Um, I'm not entirely sure I followed that part, but if you can create your own provisioning server, there are solutions where you can have basically a USB stick that will emulate a computer with a LAN and so on. And wouldn't that be a way to make it very easy and maybe quicker than what you proposed? Uh, so with the uh, so let me understand your question. So you're saying with the provisioning server has to be on the same LAN and you, you're proposing a simpler solution. Um, so the reason I didn't follow that approach is because there is a Linux provisioning server and I didn't want to use the Windows one. Uh, and uh, being on the same LAN segment, you can still physically plug in the LAN of the laptop and uh, uh, have AMD call out to your server. That's, that's not a problem. Uh, what it does mean that you have to carry that along, just like the other option I went with. Uh, so it doesn't matter if, and with the LAN adapter, I think that's what I heard you say, uh, the problem is AMT will not use LAN uh, USB LAN adapters. It will use native LAN adapters. So you have to somehow hijack, get into the native LAN and not USB LAN. So I understood that basically there is a small TCP IP stack in AMT. Even So if, even if it's turned off, basically... Uh, yeah. yeah. Did, did some, did, are you aware of some work of uh, fuzzing this or try, you know? I'm, I'm not sure about, uh, I'm not aware of any fuzzing work, but I know that a lot of people are doing RE on it. So they've okay. uh, dumped the image and then, it, I, I think it's more productive for the moment. Okay. Any more questions? Oh. Okay, well thanks very much, Roger. Thank you.